There you yep. are. Well, great, you've got it there. So that's that's even better. There's something a little bit meta about somebody who offers courses on how to write courses or writes a book on how to organize information so um, and so forth. And so I think you're probably subject to your your students and readers looking with greater greater critique eyes at <laughs> at your work at all times that that's a brave position to be in thank you well it's a fun position um, it's sort of the it's the only place i was going to be because this is what i do you know but it, you're right it, yes. it can get a little bit you know hall of mirrors <laughs> well you have um you have a really interesting um educational background and i want to touch on that because some folks will not not necessarily know which angle they'd like to come in to uh, to reading a book like yours, and I'll maybe say a few words for for your benefit uh, around the folks that mainly listen to us and with whom we share and talk and so on. That'd be great. So, uh, and and that's in aid of sharing what what you've studied, but and also what your work is. <clears throat> So our, our historic headquarters is Southeast Asia, Singapore in particular. And that's an interesting place because it's almost like Europe in that you get multiple like nations, currencies, well, not currencies in the Europe case, but in Southeast Asia, regulatory environments, cultures, food preferences, etc., all in one area that operates a lot of the time as, as one. The folks that we interact with most, Rebecca, tend to be um, professional services. So you can think uh, consulting, law, accounting, the classic professions, as well as maybe some of the more recent ones. Um, and we tend to focus on, I'd say two, two things. One is how, one is how people who are already very credentialed, very naturally intelligent, very driven, um, improve and develop themselves, that uncover dimensions of their existing impressive skill set to build up. So we like to talk about them as people with 20 years experience and three degrees. <laughs> so, uh, and often one of those as a professional certification. Um, and I think another, the, one of the ways in which we engage them, this is Sage's chief work, is we help them organize their academies. So a lot of organizations would love to teach, focus on how they teach and learn in the workplace, but it isn't always clear how to do that beyond uh, some of the tried and true methods, say in law, such as mm -hmm. falling under the, under the caring wing of a senior partner. Gotcha. Well, that that is obviously a great method, but there are other things to do too uh, besides that. So we tend to have conversations with them about the substance of what they can and should teach and learn, whether that comes from outside the organization or bubbles up from inside the organization. And this conversation is the first in a series where we want to look at the mechanics and the and the tactics of how you could actually teach your own people the things that you already know how our clients um, can take first steps in terms of taking those wise and experienced folks internally and helping manifest that wisdom and that knowledge and that experience in practical ways that you know, younger or less less experienced colleagues can learn it. So I hope that's I hope that's instructive by way of context in terms of who we who we work with and who listens in. So what? Let me translate it into sort of my own language and tell me if I've got this right. It sounds to me like okay. you take you help subject matter experts who are generally services you know professionals, and you help them translate their expertise. Is it mainly internally within the organization as a kind of training for their, you know, junior partners, younger members? And is it online training or is it, I mean, in-person training, some of it de delivered through digital media? How do, how do you set these academies up? So you're right in the first part 
um, there's an there's an end to that, which is that we also bring external uh, okay. experts to bear um, uh, for for our clients. Um, it's we are sort of their humble servants, and so if they feel like it needs to be in person in a stadium with 450 employees, the the answer to that is just yes, and we'll help them figure out the the most effective configurations for that. Um, but they often will will rely on our discretion, and what we've discovered is that <clears throat> you always want a portion of it to be online. Yeah, it's definitely even when you can see people right in front of you, and there's no travel restrictions and, and other things. You always want a portion of it to be online. So it sounds like in some ways we do sort of similar things, but you do it on a much bigger scale, of course. You know, because you're a whole organization. Uh, with many people. Um, so I'm intrigued, like, I, I kind of feel like the course design formula is almost like a chip, like a computer chip, you know, that you can put into that process. It's like, I, I came up with a phrase the other day that I thought was meaningful. It's like an algorithm you can use to organize the distrib distribution of knowledge and expertise. It's a methodology or a process, you know. So, um, my question for you and especially for your listeners is, you know, what, what's the thing that is most challenging in that process that like they wish there was kind of like a magic solution to? I can't, I can't speak really authentically on their behalf. So I'm going to have a crack at it on their behalf, but I'll certainly speak. Uh, I'll speak with my, my own perspective. Um, I think the challenge is even understanding that they have a lot to share and, and, and getting them to measure about how much that is. And it's, it may be um, uh, that can kind of presage one, one of the questions I want to ask you, which is roughly how big is a course? Um, but uh, in our work, one of the things that we have to really remind the senior folks is the things that are obvious to you that seem like they're not even worthy of taking time to delineate mm -hmm. as clear instruction are, are like three levels away from where your junior analysts are at. That, that's so, such a, oh, sorry, go ahead. And, and, and so that by itself, uh, it's kind of our job to watch the moments where we think that's being taken for granted and and press the brake and say, I, I have to share with you that, you know, your your instincts for how to hire people are deep and well-trained instincts, but they don't just come out of the ether from nothing. Uh, or or maybe it's, you know, the, the way that you edit a complex document is worthy of, you know, three modules worth of careful study. Um, so anyway, that seems to be the the biggest challenge. It's upstream of design. Actually, I think it's perfect. It's the perfect starting place. And, and I love it because really there's a, there's a couple of things that come together there. One is, you know, the whole thing about unconscious competence. I mean, people who are at that level of expertise are very competent. They know exactly what they're doing, but the, and it's, un, it's automatic. So they're long beyond the stage where they, you know, are thinking about each step in the process. So I didn't come up with that phrase unconscious competence as part of a framework, you know, which I wish I could attribute, but I don't know the name of where it comes from. But it's an important principle to keep in mind. They do it really well. They do it automatically. So your job is to come in and say, OK, how do we unpack this for someone who doesn't know how to do it, you know, who's 20 years behind? And the other part of that is something called the expert blind spot which is even if they know as an expert, oh, I need to teach, you know, the junior associates how to, how our, what our process is for doing this. The, it's hard for them to know what a non-expert needs help with, you yes. know, and that's where those three modules come in. And where the course design formula comes in is it can help you understand what the three modules or four modules more likely need to be, or however many. So I also loved your other question, if, if if you want me to go there, about how big is a course, because I think that's just a brilliant. Let's do it. That, we're in. We're in. That's actually, Kevin, the question. It's, it's, it's a deceptively right. simple question. I call it the trippy issue of scale. 
And, and I just, by meaning the scale of what you're designing, you know, and the, the, the short answer is as big as it needs to be to teach, you know, to reach the course learning goal. So the first thing is you have to have a clear goal for your instruction, you know, for whatever you're calling the course, what do you, how do you want people to be different at the end of it? That is the single question that everything else depends on. And a lot of people don't realize that. They think, oh, we'll just pass on everything we know. Or, you know, and that you be there a hundred years doing that. It's like, what is the result that you want learners to have? You know, and then now you can go backwards and say, wait, which learners, you know, who's it for? You know, what do you want them to be able to do at the end? And what do they already know that either is going to be helpful or sometimes it's unhelpful and they need to unlearn things. Or sometimes there's a gap, like they know something that's sort of on the way to the right thing, but there's a gap from where you wanted to start what you're teaching to where they need to be. So all of those, what you said upstream from you know the design, but you have to start upstream because before you can even start designing, you have to understand what your design, you know, is there a need for it? What is it, who's it for, and where do you start? So all of those questions have to happen first before you even design anything. Then you get into the question, how big should it be? So I am gonna introduce my virtual virtual assistant. This is Babushka. She helps me teach this concept, <laughs> okay? And the reason I, I use this and you'll see in a minute is because of the issue of scale. So here's your whole, you know, the biggest thing you're designing, your whole course. Now this could also be your whole business enterprise you can also have a design. So you decide what the biggest doll is, right? Let's say it's a course. Then here's your modules, here's your lessons. And inside, you know, you can even have smaller things, individual media items, PDFs, whatever. So each of these can have its own design. But what, what I find, the reason that the course design formula is like a chip for your brain, you know, that helps make this process that can otherwise be quite overwhelming, helps simplify it, is that once you answer those preliminary questions that kind of emerged organically when you said, you know, we're upstream and here's our, here's our situation. Once you answer those, you know, who's it, is it needed first of all, you know, who's it for, um, what do they already know, you know, and what do we want them to be able to do at the end that they couldn't do before? Once you, once you're clear on those things, which are all part of the formula, then there's this kind of magical effect that happens. Have you ever seen those tea bags that have like flowers inside them? They're really beautiful. Yes. They're like artisanal tea bags, right? And you drop it in a pot of hot water and then it opens up magically. That's what happens when you've got your learning goal correctly defined for the whole course for, for the outer doll level. So let's say it's to teach a skill. You know, at the end, they should be able to give me an example of a skill that what somebody might need to teach. The, I, I'm not being cheeky, but the weaving of baskets. It's a skill. Is, is that a real one that your people actually need to do? I, I'd, I'd love no, to hear. No, but I was I was thinking when I was preparing for our conversation that basket weaving is always the one that gets that gets made fun of. And then I was like, wait a minute, like we'll talk about a skill. If you want one, if you want one from um, from our our world, that's very common. It's um, it's how you how you save, edit, and process documents as a team. So like things like version control and you know, making sure you don't trip over one another as you do that. So you don't end up with like some somebody does a whole lot of work and then somebody saves over it back to an earlier. Oh my goodness, that would be a nightmare. Okay, so so what do you want the team to be able to do at the end that they couldn't do before? Never, never lose anything of value, um, but also not. Uh, so so that's sort of like an end outcome that valuable things are not deleted, lost. Uh, inadvertently um, lost uh, and, and then maybe I think a second value is there isn't inefficient time wastage because people are trying to contribute simultaneously so it's efficient so let's, production so let's say we said that the the learning goal for this whole course is going to be how to efficiently save documents as a team so as never to lose valuable information does that sound sure. tight Okay, so the first test you have to go through is, you know, is this actually 
a procedure that everyone has to do the same way? Is it is it a skill like, you know, everyone, you'll teach it one way and it'll work that way for everyone? Or is it, I think that the answer to that would be yes in your case, you know? So let's let's just take that example. So the, uh, Robert Gagné, who's an educational researcher and theorist, sort of divided all learning up into five, he called them domains of learning based on what type of activity the learner will be able to do at the end. So if they're able to perform a skill, you know, I, I sort of distilled Gagné's ideas down into making it easy to create learning from it. So first they got to understand the big ideas behind, you know, why do we need to save documents as a team? So that's your first module. And, you know, of course you have your welcome and all that. I'm ignoring that. Um, they need to understand the big ideas. You, you explained some of them, you know, why this is important. If we don't do it this way, we'll lose things. We'll save over each other. We'll waste time. So understanding the big ideas. Um, then you, then the second um, big section of the course is going to be tools and resources. So make sure they understand, you know, whatever platform they're using or, you know, the mechanisms of saving. The third thing is steps to follow, how to save a document, step one, step two, step three, step four, probably is a check to make sure there's not a later version you're saving over or something like that. And then the fifth, the fourth part, excuse me, is make it work for you or troubleshooting. I would probably call it troubleshooting in that case, mm -hmm. which in, you know, that last one is, is really has a lot of latitude for it's, it's how to let people know everything they have to understand in order to perform the skill under all conditions they actually face. Because if you teach a rule, but, oh, it doesn't work on an Apple computer, or you teach a rule, but it doesn't work if teams are in different areas or whatever the conditions, that's not going to work. So, mm -hmm. you know, it tells you the size of the course based on the learning goal. Now, how big do each of those sections have to be? You know, that depends on, you know, is it simple? Is it complicated? How many exceptions do you have? But is that helpful? Is that a helpful way to look at it in terms of, I'm sort of still trying to answer how big is a course. But, um, you know, so a how-to course like that. It is. I like your, yeah, well, and I like your um, babushka uh, <laughs> uh, image. <laughs> yeah, I bet. I bet. I was imagining you running a workshop and it's like everybody's got a uh, matryoshka on the table when, when they begin. That would be fun to send out as a swag or something, you know. So, you know, th this is a very trippy issue, though, Kevin, because let's say you get into the design and you discover, and this often happens, it happens to a lot of my um, participants in my master course, you know, who are, you know, individual experts in a field and they've got a skill they want to teach. Yes. What happens, and this could happen in your situation we're talking about too, what happens if you discover that People are very resistant to learning this because they have a mindset about, you know, we've got to save our version before the people in that other office or who knows what their issue would be, some mindset issue. So then you might need a preliminary course before people are even ready to learn the skill. It's all about, say, a team building mindset or, right. you know, and, and so if you're interested, I can go into like how you would create a mindset course, but that's. Yes, well, well, let's let's maybe think about it that question in this way. Uh, I have witnessed many organizations now get stuck on this particular place. They sit back and they look at the castle in the sky that will be their future academy or their future curriculum, and it remains only a castle in the sky because they don't know where. What is the most ideal, like ontological prior? module rather than this one so say let's take something like the sales process well should you be talking about leads generation or should you be talking about your ideal client profile or should you be talking about how to introduce yourself in a single sentence and because they can't figure out which one comes first they don't make any they don't they don't make any any um courses or or they delay certainly delay a long time so what what do you say about that because on the one hand they're not fools. They're trying to do something that is probably informed by experience, which is let's not sprint off and discover that we've started right in the middle. If by thinking a little while we could start at the start, 
I have my own bias, so maybe it's showing already, but how do you how do you preempt or deal with that problem with your with your uh, clients and learners? Well, so before I answer it, can I sort of bring in a framework of like how do we approach a question with wisdom as opposed to knowledge? Yeah. Because great, so great. This is Mother Rebecca. Mother Rebecca is me if I were two hundred years old and actually knew everything. This is the first book I wrote, and you know it's really about how do we solve problems with wisdom? You know, it's, it's humorous, it's fun. It's like, you know, it's not specific to learning design. It's about life lessons. And so the the question that you're asking, the, the reason that, and, and everyone runs into that problem at every scale on every topic. And the reason is they begin with their, what I call gems of content. And I, I have an actual gem that I like to share. So this is their gems of content. <laughs> You know, and, and the thing is, it's significant that it's a gem. Every single thing you mentioned is very valuable. And they know that it's valuable. The trouble is they, they can't, as you said so articulately, they can't come up with a structure for transferring these gems from their own, you know, mental storage warehouse to someone else's. And I learned this, Kevin, the hard way myself. I had my own gems. You know, I had a whole program that I'd done for many years in person, worked perfectly. It was instructionally designed, tested. And so those were my gems. And when I was trying to figure out how to put that online, it was like an octopus. I just couldn't, there was nothing to grab onto. It keeps getting away from you, tangling you up. You will never make it work if you start from the gems. So what I tell people to do is, we're not taking them away. We need them. Put them in a treasure chest, but imagine you can get a real one if it helps you, you know, an imaginary treasure chest on your desk and lock that up. We're going to start from, you really have to always start from your vision of what you want the program to do. And when I work with, with my coaching clients, for example, I actually literally take them through a visioning process that ends at the course learning goal, you know, but, but it's sort of a roundabout process because I want to tap into their hopes and dreams. See, what, what you're describing is people are stuck at the hopes and dreams and they never bring it down to earth, you know, and that's because they need this structure that will help them do that. So once we're clear, once we go through a visioning process of what you want to achieve, we're clear on the learning goal and the scope. That's the other piece, the size piece. All of these, the reason this is a complex thing is that they all interrelate. Of course. You know? And I, you know, I've run eight uh, cohorts now of my master course, and I've watched this in practice. And I know one of your one of your uh, things you were interested in exploring was sort of how do you test and refine and iterate, and that's part of it. You have to create something and practice. So yes. what I see is that sometimes they think it's going to be, you know, their whole academy, and it turns out, oh, it just needs to be a PDF. More often, it goes the other way. You know, like you said, yeah. they think, oh, this is just a simple course on how to do X, Y, Z. And then they discover, oh, but nobody wants to do that because they have a mindset issue. Or maybe there's an organizational structure issue that's blocking this. Or some people don't have the right equipment. There's lots of reasons why it might not work. So I recommend, I mean, the whole process that I teach is a process of backwards design. And, and the problem, to sum up what you're saying, the reason it's not working is they're doing forwards design. They're saying, I've got this and I want to take it from here to there. Instead of saying my ultimate, I want to get to Paris, right? And I'm here. Instead of saying going forward, you're not going to end up in Paris. Instead, go backwards from Paris. So you for sure will end up at Paris once you, you know, put people forwards through your design that you've designed backwards. That's, and backwards design is hard because it's like looking in a mirror with mirror writing. You have to see it mm. from the learner's point of view. You know, and that's what the course design formula does is simplifies that process because it takes, you know, research into what is the learner's point of view. So, for example, for mindset change, I, you know, I, I can tell you what the process would be for that. And it, it just works. It works every time, which is very interesting. So it's, it takes all the stress out of that because there's an unlimited number of gems and you will, as you've discovered, you'll run all over the place. So instead of saying yeah. I'm here and I want to go there, say my end result is I must achieve this. Now, how do I, you know, make sure I get there? 
Let's let's do a, a kindness to some folks who are new to this field and just take a little uh, a little drive through the countryside of vocabulary, a glossary, if you would. So and, and I think I can commend your writing about this because it's very clear in your book. But what is a lesson, a module, a course, a curriculum, because these are technical words. They aren't, they aren't casual phrases, right? Can you just, can you just sort of delineate those words? Because the, they're, they're in the common language, but they're not used in common language in the way, Rebecca, maybe you use them. So can we, can we kind of nerd out for a second and, and do, a, do a vocabulary? <laughs> lesson there. Absolutely. And Kevin, you're illustrating one of the principles of learning design, which is that in order to learn any skill, you must define the concepts that people have to understand to perform it. And, you know, the thing is, these are words that are in the common language used lots of different ways by different people. So, for example, different course platforms will call different things by, you know, a lesson in one course platform is a module in another course platform. So, yeah. Tell me the terms and I'll tell you how I define them. What's the first one? I'm going to throw in an extra one that's that's uh, Rebecca Cueva specific. Media, lesson, module, course, curriculum. Media. Okay. Can I write in, in the chat or? Yes, please. Or okay. I so that write, way we'll, write, we'll have it. Okay. So the first one is media, right? The yeah. second one. Tell me the second one again. Lesson. Lesson. Okay. Course. Oh, are you going? Oh, sorry, module was next. Module was module. next. Module, yeah. Then course. Course, okay. Then curriculum. Okay, I love it. So curriculum. Okay, great. So we're starting from the smallest doll. Okay. So uh, we're actually starting from what this doll is made of. You said media. So media comes from a word that means something that's in the middle. You know, it actually comes from a word like membrane that allows stuff to pass from one. So media allows ideas to pass from one mind to another. So the me what I mean by media is, um, you know, video, PDF, you know, the actual stuff your course is made of, you know, and in my backwards design process, that's the last thing that you pick. Because that's another thing that doesn't work is if you start from saying, oh, I want to make a video. Now you've already limited what you can do in specific ways. So the media decisions should be the very last. So then you've got um, media, then you said lesson. So the media sits within a lesson. You know, a lesson is a kind of coherent learning, a lesson is like a coherent learning experience. Robert Gagné, the, the educational researcher I referenced says that learning means arranging a series of events you know, that lead to a change in behavior. So a lesson to me is an encapsulated series of those events. I use, Gagné has something called the nine events of instruction. So it's like one lesson, you're gonna do all nine events. You're gonna tell them what they're gonna learn. You're, you know, you're gonna take them through learning it and you're gonna help them process it. So a lesson is kind of a, like a scene in a play, you know? Yep. And then a module, the way I use it, is a group of lessons that kind of are one big chunk, mm -hmm. you know, that, that, that have kind of a, that lead to a, like a, a module is like a checkpoint or a way station on the way to, to a goal. So that they're sort of the structural supports of a course. And then a course is, you know, a, a unified um, experience, but it doesn't all have to happen. So the course is like the play, you know what I mean? So, yeah. yeah. So, okay. So to do the play analogy, which I've never used before, but it kind of makes sense here. The course is like the play, the modules are like the acts, the lessons are like the scenes and the media are like the actual props and costumes that make the play come to life, you know? So right. if you think about it in terms of a play, no playwright would go, I want to make a great play. And you know what? Let me start with the spear. I mean, we're like, you know, there's lots of things you could do with the spear. And now we're already into violence. I mean, what's this play about, you know? So, so the media comes last. So um, I had a thought, which I now can't remember, but oh, curriculum. 
So the curriculum would be like, it could be a series of courses. You know, it's each of these structures is bigger than the others, but I recommend that in terms of design, you start from the biggest and go to the smallest. And mm -hmm. that's hard for people because they think, well, how do I know what, again, they're focused on the gems and they don't understand how to organize it. But the secret is when you start from the biggest, you don't say what's in it. You say, what do I want it to do? How do I want people to be different great. as a result? Yeah, and, great. And you can't expect to always know that right away. In other words, this is kind of an iterative process of, and by iterative, I mean, you try it, you see if it's working, you, you see if you like it, you know, like, for example, with my book, my book teaches a how-to skill, right? Big ideas, tools and resources, which is the course design formula, steps to follow, make it work for you. That's a how-to. I taught my own course six times before I realized the course is not a how-to. The course is what's called a cognitive strategy, where you learn how to learn how to apply this how-to to your yes. specific situation. That's the challenge. You know, it's not the same for everyone. When you, yeah. So when you said you have to think about what you want it to do or what you want people to do, and then you said uh, that it's you're learning to learn. I think this uh, this is my this is my green light to open up the uh, the thicket of of challenges that are assessment. So me. maybe we can, this, you know, um, for, for the uninitiated, obviously you could write a brilliant course. It's so engaging that the substance is great. People are ripping through it. And then somewhere at the end, somebody uh, maybe annoyingly will say like, oh, well, how do you know that anybody learned anything? I mean, just because they were smiling when they were looking at the screen or just because everybody seemed to uh, run around with a cheerful look on their face in the you know, in the conference room, how do you know anybody actually learned anything you hoped that they would? So that also turns out to be not a straightforward puzzle, but can you just, can you just say what you've learned and how you guide new course writers on how to deal with that problem? First of all, I love the question. And you know, that is really the question, Kevin, you know, because why are we doing this? We're doing it to get a result. You know, you have to know if you're if, you're, if your goal is to get to Paris, you have to know if you actually got to Paris, you know? Yes. <laughs> yeah, great. <laughs> Super. So, so, you know, just to keep that example for a minute, you know, the first thing you would say is, well, how will we know if we got to Paris? You'd say, well, what are the characteristics of Paris? You know, is it this longitude and latitude? It has the Eiffel Tower. People are speaking French. You know, there's, you have people speaking French doesn't tell you that you got to Paris, though, because they yes. speak French in other places, too. So you have to be very precise about how you know that you arrived, you know, what the goal is, what type of learning is gonna to take to get there, how you know you got there. So what I teach my students, and we just did this last week, so it's very fresh in my mind, is uh, to create something called a rubric, which is a tool that a lot of, you know, educators use to sort of lay out what are the specific, you know, abilities or skills or mindset changes, you know, results that you want people to have. And then for each one, what does performance look like, desirable performance? And I like to break it down by levels, you know, because people, you can't expect people who are just starting out in the course, they're at lesson one, to have the same level of proficiency you expect from them, you know, at the end. So, you know, some people do this with great rigor. I mean, if you're doing a, a certification course and people have to pass, you know, an exam, a proficiency exam, which you may be doing that, I, I, I don't know for some of the things you described, you know, then it's probably gonna be very rigorous and maybe to certain degrees of performance that are specified by the profession. If you're doing more, you know, feel good or, or you know, just kind of general um, knowledge, it may not have to be that rigorous and making it that rigorous might take all the fun out of it, but, you know, and there may be more wiggle room. You also have to decide who determines that these performance stages have been reached. You know, mm -hmm. I, I asked that question at the very first when we're visioning, who's going to, how will you know you've achieved this and who decides that? So if Great. it's a course on, you know, feel better fast, you know, sure, you could do some objective measurements of, you know, psychological tests or something. But the real test is, does the person feel better? 
do they tell you they feel better? And does their behavior demonstrate they feel better? So for example, for my course, the, the true assessment is that my students are getting feedback from their students, that their students love the course, their students are recommending it to others. It took me almost two years to get start getting the first kind of feedback like that, but that's authentic feedback. So, you know, that's a whole science to both feedback and assessment, but I, I love that you asked it, and I think that's the critical question. You, you've got to set that up before you even start designing the course, is ask, how will we know? And, and also, you don't generally want to just have, create a huge amount of instruction and then have like one test at the end, because by then it's too late. You need to have what's called formative assessment, like going through the course, you know, where while the course is in progress, you're checking with your students all the time. I like to do it every session, you know, how's everyone doing? Any questions? And create a real climate where, you know, the only dumb question is the one you don't ask. Because if people don't, you know, feel safe to say that, and, and again, I'm sure there's a cultural component. I listened to this wonderful um, webinar that you had about, with uh, Kevin about, no, you're Kevin, with um, Ken about- Kyle um, Hegarty. Yeah, Kyle, yeah, about um, cross-cultural. I listened to it last night and I loved it. And I thought that is such an interesting design challenge you know, because people learn differently or ask questions differently. So I think in your case, the make it work for you piece of your learning design is probably always going to have to include those cultural components, which you're fortunately an expert on, you know, but for everything that you design, you may have to teach it differently, depend, you know, and, and assess differently, you know, because what if you're in a culture where it's rude to say you don't understand something? Yes. then you can't ask people to just tell you, you know, that's not going to be a reliable indicator. I have a, I have a fun uh, page from our, from our uh, field book, I guess, that you, you may enjoy in terms as by way of an exercise. We have a, we have a course on how to ask more um, effective questions when you're in uh, a client conversation. And a lot of that has to do with very old, you know, thousands of year old studies and structures in terms of the way that you can configure language and how you can pose a question um, in a variety of ways. Well, all of that is also based on, you know, if you're looking at the Romans or the Greeks on Greek or, or Latin and so on. And so you get this challenge. The exercise was take any of the following six question structures and make the best possible translation in Vietnamese, Khmer, Malay, uh, Thai, um, uh, Bahasa Indonesia. And so you get this uh, incredible overlay because they have to take the original structure or which, you know, it's, it's choose your, you know, dealer's choice. But then it has to be like, well, you know, if you're going to ask an either or question in Vietnamese, in terms of the cultural tenor, but also the specific language we'd use, here's how we think you want to do it and um anyway th that by itself is like sort of a, a a three for one uh lesson or or exercise that's so, so brilliant it, you know i i had a linguistics professor once who said that when you learn a new language you learn a new way of thinking you know and i definitely right. heard i heard that in the in the webinar last night too that you can't divorce you know you can't divorce language from culture but even when people yes. speak the same language, you know, the example of the, the British and the Americans totally not understanding each other, I thought was, that's <laughs> happened to me, I totally get it, you know? So it's it's language, but it's, it's what, what do people, just like you asked me to define what I mean by lesson and curriculum, you know, mm. people may be using the same words, but mean different things by it. I, want, I have a question for you, Kevin. Are there some questions you just can't ask in certain languages? I don't Not speak enough languages to, to, to know that, but I'll give you the closest example from, from a language I know I have some entry into. Um, in Japanese, there's a word for impossible and there's a word for difficult. And um, when, when they're used in, in business, they almost mean the opposite of, of what is intended. So if you say, um, so it's, Muri or muzukashi. Muzukashi is difficult. Um, 
if if I if I as a vendor say asked you like look is this something that we can do together Rebecca and you said that's difficult it kind of means that's no forget it no. never gonna happen yeah whereas if you said and a little on context and tone that's impossible it's kind of an invitation for me to start working out the ways in which we might make it not impossible wow um, that's so and so how I would think yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you imagine in California, right? If you're working, you're working with a publisher or something, and they said, "Rebecca, it's impossible." Be like, "Well, I'm there's done. nothing more needs to be said." Yeah. And if they say it's difficult, that's your that's your like yellow light, like proceed, but proceed with some caution. Um, so yeah, I think there, I think those kinds of those kinds of puzzles abound. It it, it you must have su you must love what you're doing because that that just you know if you love culture and you love you know sort of helping people and you love a challenge i, I mean i feel like what you described I, I don't know any of those languages you know so mm -hmm. I, I would be able to, to to work with those languages but um i know that um i had a we had a family friend who was a professor of arabic when i was a small child he came to our house and he was drinking tea and he kept putting sugar cubes in the tea and he said you know in arabic there's no way to say this tea is too sweet and I was just, you know, fascinated. I said, what do you mean? There's no word for that? He said, oh, no, you can say it's too sweet, literally, but it means it's just right. And that that's why I decided I need to study Arabic, because I was always being told, you're too this, you're too that, you're too fresh, you're too smart, you're too, you know, and, and it, it meant a bad thing, you know, in an English context. And I was like, wow, a yeah. whole language and culture where too much is just right? How do I, how do I find this? You know? <laughs> yeah so 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 you know what's literally <laughs> meant and, and and as you said in the webinar too like what's literally some cultures they say what they mean literally but as you said even this gets to the feedback piece too even in the feedback giving a feedback some of those very direct cultures you know give feedback in indirect ways maybe because they have a higher order rule which is we should be clear and direct, but we don't want to hurt anybody's feelings or people mm. work better when they're sort of enthusiastically supported, you know, so. That goes into the feedback piece that we, we want to give feedback that supports the learning goal and keeps people on track. You also said something I wanted to address earlier. You said people might say they had a great time in the conference room doing the activity, but how do we know they learned anything? Th that ties into a, a topic I talk about in the later parts of the book called cognitive load. And, and yes. I, I have to introduce my friend here. This is the cognitive load toad. He's going to Hawaii because we don't want him in our courses. We're sending him to Hawaii. So this is a way to remember about cognitive load, which is because it's kind of ugly and in the, we don't like toads really, right? So the cognitive load toad represents this idea that things can make your course really hard to learn. You know, and there's three things that can happen for that. One is that the material itself is just very, very hard to learn intrinsically. It's like intrinsically big or heavy. The solution to that is cut it up into smaller parts or make sure people have a lot of strength coming in, like a lot of prior knowledge so that it's only incrementally a small amount for them. The second one is it could be designed, maybe it's easy to understand, but the way it's designed is so bulky and complicated. Like an example is, a very confusing explanation of how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Mm -hmm. You know, you understood it before the person started explaining it, but by the time they're done, you're all turned around. That's called extraneous cognitive load. And then the third one, which is what you're talking about, is called germane cognitive load, which means the work that people have to do, the, their active involvement in the learning task. So people having fun in the break room is a good sign. They're actively involved, they're engaged. But this is the trickiest one to balance because you don't want them to just remember we played a fun game, but you say, oh yeah, and what did you learn from the game? I, I learned that, you know, I like Susie's way of playing games. You know, that's not <laughs> helpful. You know, so you yeah. have to be very, people don't realize that designing instruction, I know you realize that you're a professional, so you do this all day long, but many people don't realize that designing instruction is an art and a science, you know? And, and the science has to do with, you know, the actual mechanics of what you're designing. The art, there's also an art though. 
So the way I think about it is imagine you have a blueprint and that's the science, right? And you're, you know, you want to achieve a certain result. You've got a blueprint. You apply the blueprint to your content. So now let's say that I, I'm going to switch metaphors. Your content is like a tree that you're going to make a canoe out of. So you know what kind of canoe you want to make. You have a blueprint for that. Well, two people have two different trees. That's their content. The, the grain of the wood, the hardness of the wood is, you know, different for, for each type of content. So that's where the artfulness comes in. You know, how do you take these principles of learning design and make them work with your, you know, not to, and also not just the grain of the wood, but who's going to be driving the canoe, you know, what type of paddlers, what type of water, you have to understand the whole context, but in order not to end up with the result you described at the beginning of people get paralyzed and never do anything because it's overwhelming. That's what the course design formula provides you with is a kind of step-by-step -step process for learning the whole instrument panel of the airplane. So you can control all the variables, to, you know, confidently depending on what your goals are, which is why my master course is, is not just a how-to, it's what's called a cognitive strategy where you learn how to learn, how to apply this how-to process to yeah. your exact, you know, the, your canoe, your people, your, you know. And that's what, we, I mean, you must do this all day long, Kevin, in the courses that you design. That's basically what you do is calibrate and understand the needs of, you know, the, whoever you're designing your instruction for so that you can tailor it. D does that sound right? Well, well, I have uh, an um, amazing um, team member in our team who's an instructional designer, um, se several times over certified, and and she's especially good at the science. She's just got like hawk eyes for slightly loosely framed assessments or an assessment that might be metacognition, but it's not supposed to be. So it's like, make your choice. Do you want it or don't you? So we have this just like tremendous <laughs> asset within our team, Wonderful. which is Danielle Ryder. She's just very good at her craft. The the art, I think the art, I, I really appreciate what you're saying there. And I suppose what I wonder is when, when folks come to you and they wanna take your masterclass or they read you for the first time, or they just kind of sniffing around, like maybe I could write a course, let's see, they take guidance from you. Do they tend to come with a with a deficit in the in the science or a deficit in the art, or is it kind of just depends on the character? Well, I think they come. Remember, people are come. Most people that are coming to me are not learning designers themselves. If they are, then now it's really meta, you know, to the point that it could be confusing. But most of them are they're subject matter experts. Most of them are what I call the quiet founders of movements. In other words, they. And that might be a slight difference from the audience you described where, so let me understand this first. Your audience sounds like they're very skilled professionals in established fields that have procedures and policies of how you do things, you know, that they need to teach. Many That's of fair. the people that come to me, even if they are that as well, they have created something new. They're what I call category kings or category queens. They, they created something, and they may not think of themselves that way, but we discovered on my very first pilot class for the master course that everybody was creating a whole new way of doing something. Right. So what they are trying to do is, is come up with a way to teach their methodology that they've invented, you know, get it out there into the world. So mm -hmm. they're very... They have an, an extreme knowledge of their methodology. Um, some of them have read my book already, you know, but I think that the, the challenge for everybody, whether it's your people, my people, is how do you, no matter how much you know about this stuff, the challenge is how do you apply it? Yes. And that's, that's where my course is a cognitive strategy where you teach the strategy. Okay, here's what we're going to do. Here's, and I broke down the steps of the course design formula, like here's how you determine the course learning goal. Here's how you discover the domain of learning, the type of learning, you know, here's how you set up your modules. But then for each of those, that it's not enough to just understand it theoretically. The next step is of a cognitive strategy is practice. So I have like a self-paced action plan. They have to go and 
actually, you know, and that's where the rubber meets the road. That's the part, you know, the germane cognitive load, the, the um, yes. learner's involvement. That's the no pain, no gain. There's going to be a little pain. You have to take them out of their comfort zone, especially when you're creating something very new that's never been here before. Like one of my students asked me, can you give me some examples of how to do? I said, no, because you're creating, there is no example. You're, you're the first yes. one to make this, you know? So in that case, I find what works best is a high-end coaching session where it's like two people lifting a heavy couch. They lift the subject matter expertise that they're experts on. I focus on the course design formula, you know, for them, because it's almost kind of hard for them to do both at the same time when they're when it's so new and so high intensity so yes I hope I answered what you were asking the only challenge that I'm having with all of this is that we don't have another three hours to to talk to talk about it because you're you, you, every you're just giving me rabbit trails that I'd like to go on with you um, how can we make that happen I'd love to have more conversation absolutely um there's one there's one line of query that I won't be I, re, I really won't be satisfied unless we get to it. Um, and and that's how you something like how you decide who's in a cohort and you have a section in the book where you're talking about this, but it really matters in the workplace. So, you know, I'm <clears throat> and, and, and the problem is kind of fractal like it, it even if you cut a cohort down, then you still have a bell curve inside the cut down group. And then even if you cut that that group down, you you have that again. But I really I really watch heads of HR or heads of business units or regional managing directors sweat bullets over this stuff because they don't want to say I'm sorry this 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 internal workplace learning opportunity is only for the gifted and talented and the rest of the schmucks can sit on the sideline. On the other hand, they know they know that if they try to deliver this to the entire spectrum of folks that exist inside pretty much any group, but their, their teams, it really puts a huge burden on, you know, the course, the exercises, et cetera. You've done some thinking and you've had, you know, you've been elbow deep in this puzzle. Can you just, it's, a, I think Rebecca, maybe what I'd like is like, your words to those people in the midst of that difficulty, right? So as opposed to speaking to me about it, you know, maybe practitioner to practitioner, it's like when people are facing that puzzle, what do you, what do you guide them to do? Well, I think, you know, I actually have a whole mini course on that. And what we're talking about, up till now, we've been talking about point B, Paris, you know, the, where we want to take people, but you're talking about point A, where are they starting from? Yeah. You know, and and how do you determine which starting points are acceptable and which are maybe going to require a different course or you just can't get there from here or whatever it is, you know, yeah. and what I'm hearing, too, is that, you know, these are HR people or in organizations. So there are probably some, you know, rules that they have to follow, whether it's equal access rules or, you know, whatever. So what I would say to them is determine the. Think about the prerequisites for the course, whether it's qualities of, you know, whether it's prior knowledge, whether it's personal qualities, whether it's years in the company, whatever the prerequisites are, and, and divide them into two groups, essential, and these are some of Gagne's terms, es essential prerequisites and supporting prerequisites. And, you know, then you can say, you know, these are the things you must have, sort of like um, HR people are experts on doing this for, for job descriptions, right? You must have these things in order to participate in this course. It would be very nice if you also had these things. You know, if you don't have these essential ones though, you know, and of course then, it, then you can't be in it. Of course, they've got to say it in a much more diplomatic way than that. And, and how, do you, how do you determine that? And then I, I can hear how complicated that would be and then add the cultural components. So I would say that perhaps the answer to that is to think about if someone isn't able to be in this course, how do you create a, way, a, a thing that promotes, what are the overall values you're trying to promote with the course? It, you know, if you want people to feel included, then you're, it's counterproductive if some people feel excluded and then they're gonna be grumbling and so forth. 
So how can you help them feel included in something that's a good fit for them? You know, and 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 think about it given this gets into the issue of motivation. So I would say for for maybe look at the groups of people that you've got, you know, in and I realize everyone's an individual, but the general groups and say for each group, look at the um fa motivational factors that Gagne identified, which are what are they curious about? What gives them a feeling of self-efficacy? What are they good at doing? And what do they want to achieve? Yes. And then create separate offerings for the different groups. You know, and some of those separate offerings may be like, if you want to ultimately participate in, you know, this course, you know, here are the stepping stones. And then you could almost gamify that, you know, you could, you, they could take a test. Where are you? Where are you on the path? You know, let them identify themselves, you know, and they're all good spots and make all yeah. of them desirable. I, I don't know if that's helpful, but. It is, it is helpful. It's also, I, I was, I was just writing down as you were speaking that learning's do learning is doing more things than, than simply um, uh, skill acquisition, competency oh. acquisition, knowledge acquisition. It also is this venue where maybe um, this uh, elusive uh, virtue of inclusion actually obtains maybe it's the maybe it is the place where like entertainment and retention and community building is is best obtained um we instinctively you don't want to burden it too much with too many jobs that it has to do uh but not recognizing that it achieves some of these other things is um maybe miss, missing some of its key some of its key features i i also when you I'm just going to do a tie back because you were saying with assessment, who, who decides? It's very interesting to make judicious choices about when the learner is in the driver's seat as to assigning themselves into a course or being the the key tool of measure the key person who you know applies the rubric. Um, yeah, the 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 learner themselves as as sort of being empowered to make those choices. I, I also want to say two things that are sort of meta to what to what you brought up. It's a great problem to have and shows that people are doing things right. If every people are upset when they can't be in the course, that's fantastic. Yes, I mean, that means the great. courses are seen as desirable, you know, fun, engaging, and a path forward. I, there's a lot of training that goes on where people are like, oh, they make they make me go to that again, you know. So I'm not hearing that problem. So this is great. The other piece is something that I talk about in the book towards the end of the book called what you just described, the multi-layering, I call that elegant learning, you know? And, and so the example I use is a kindergarten teacher, a skilled teacher, well, an unskilled teacher would try to get the class to line up for lunch, would just start yelling at people, tell them to line up, criticize them when they're not standing quietly. A skilled teacher would say, I wonder who's sitting quietly. Oh, Susie's sitting quietly. Susie, would you like to go sit on the red, stand on the red circle, you know? And then would you like to pick someone to stand on the green square. So there's so many things going on with that. You're teaching the curriculum, you know, which is, you know, colors, shapes, you're teaching behavior, you're rewarding people for sitting quietly, you're supporting social cohesion. So I think the multi-layering is actually essential and it's a sign of mm. skilled instruction, you know? So um, I think that's actually a wonderful problem to have that, that more people wanna be in than, than can be. And it just calls I told, for I told you that an, I told you that an hour would fly by. I knew I knew it would happen. Um, we, we we would like to stay in touch with you again and again because there's a lot we want to we want to um, converse with you about. You have a course, so so people can read your book. Uh, of course, they can, and it's quite findable. You're very findable too on on a variety of platforms. So it's not it's not like you're hard to get a hold of once people know your book name or your name, Rebecca Cuevas, Frost Good Cuevas. Time. Yeah. Um, but on the 18th of July, you're running a course, and so anybody who wants to just take a punt without digging deeper can just go straight and sign up. Also, folks who maybe thought about it for a while and have sort of more deliberately decided they want to take it. Um, more seriously and put their hand to it, I think can sign up, yes? Well, actually uh, two things. I have a course called Streamlined Course Creation, which people can sign up right now and it's totally self-paced 
and it'll take them through the whole process, you know, in a week or sooner, you know, if they want to do that, that, that they can sign up. The master course starting on um, July 18th is they have to talk to me. So the thing to do okay, there, I, yeah, I curate that very carefully uh, to make sure it's the right fit for them. And, you know, and so for that one, they should, to, to address, you know, the question that you raised earlier. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And and I treat my students like hot house, house, hot house flowers. They get a lot of attention, you know, so, um, and I also have private coaching too. So I think the best thing to do is, uh, do you have show notes where you'll be sharing, um, you know, website or yes we're we're uh we're learning as we go with our with our project called sage exchange um uh what we do as a default is we share this on linkedin oh um, which is where a lot of folks uh, gather we also share it privately so um there's a there's a distribution of uh about 1500 folks that uh, of the profile that i described Within Southeast Asia, that we just share our own private notes to, not not on not on platforms, and then we put them on YouTube. So in all those cases, uh, Rebecca, we'll just we'll link to the things that you have going on. Um, uh, but we will note. Uh, I th I'm glad you mentioned that. We'll we'll note. There's a course that's just walk in start for anybody, self paced, and, and then if folks uh, sort of feel like they might be right for the master class, then they can get in touch. And you can um, you can help steer them. Should I send you? I'll send you a follow up even email with you know the links to each of those. Yes, please. For the self paced course, it's good for someone who's very you know good at sitting down and methodically step by step following a process. They will get really yes. good results from that. Okay, it's great for them. Well. Thank you very much. Thanks for, um, uh, it's a little bit sappy, but we've made a habit of thanking people for writing a book at all in the first place. That's so nice. uh, the reason why is you don't have to, right? You could, you could just quietly retain all that knowledge and occasionally share it from time to time, but it takes real uh, time and cerebral effort and, you know, other costs, other sacrifices to, to write as you've done. So thanks for writing in the first place, but also just more broadly sharing the maybe say like the missing chapters, some of the additional editorial with us now. Thank you for your kind words, Kevin, and, and for inviting me. And I've really enjoyed our conversation. And I think your questions are so interesting. And, you know, it's also interesting to hear kind of how learning design plays out in different environments and in different, you know, cultural contexts and frameworks. So I, I've learned a lot from talking with you and I appreciate you know, what you do. And I, I can hear that what you're doing is is really work. I just love that. It, it sounds like you're, you're so immersed in that you didn't even realize that people having the problem of like, we want to be in the course and we can't be is such a fabulous problem to have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. That's one of my, that's one of my uh, real keeper quotes. I take that as a great encouragement, actually. You um, should. So glad you Absolutely. said it. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. This has just been a delight to talk with you and I look forward to continuing the conversation. Good. Thank you, Rebecca.